All right, so next up is uh, Chadin Dukmi, who will talk about uh, delegated probing and stochastic combinatorial optimization, please. All right, thanks, uh, thanks for the introduction. Um, so uh, this uh, talk is going to be based on uh, two papers, jointly uh, joint work with my students, Curtis Bechtel and Neil Patel. Uh, the first talk was in ITCS last year. Uh, a more, uh, the first paper was ITS last year. The second paper was in this EC. Neil gave a talk yesterday. Uh, but in this talk, I'm going to give a slightly higher level overview of this general direction. <clears throat> so let me introduce the idea of delegation informally. Here you have a principal who wants to solve some optimization problem uh, subject to uncertainty. Right? So. He might de delegate uh, collecting the data to an expert agent, because perhaps the principal doesn't have the expertise to explore the possible space of solutions and the quality of the various solutions. So we call uh, exploring the data probing in this talk. Um, the difficulty here, uh, there's, the game theoretic difficulty is that the principal and agent may have different objective. so objectives, so the agent may shade their uh, reports or shade the information they provide in order to further their own interests. Uh, another difficulty is that collecting data may be costly uh, or constrained in some way. Right? So I'm going to note that this is importantly different from the uh, hidden action models from contract design that you've seen in a lot of the rest of uh, this workshop and in EC. Um, in particular, uh, one important difference, and there are others, is that uh, the principal is the one who acts here. He's the one who selects the uh, solution. The agent just explores the data and suggests uh, a solution or provides information. There's other differences that I'm going to emphasize later. So let's look at an example. Let's say you're a mayor and you want to design a public transit network, which consists of a rail network and a bus network. You must pick one of each. And let's say there's five possible designs for the rail network and four for the bus network. You might delegate exploring these designs to an expert contractor. That's the agent. Um, however, there may be constraints on exploration, either hard constraints in the form of, say, for example, you may only be able to explore four designs in total, or there may be soft constraints in the sense of uh, exploring a particular design would incur cost, a known cost. Right? And also, the contractor may have alternate interests for various reasons. I've listed a couple, but there might be others. Right? Um, so the question is, how can you, the mayor, incentivize the contractor to explore and suggest transit network designs that are uh, best according to your interests, which let's say are the uh, welfare of the city? Okay. Um, so at a high level, uh, the principal faces what we call a stochastic combinatorial optimization problem with probing. Uh, and he may either solve this problem himself, assuming he has the expertise, or he may, de may delegate solving it um, to uh, an agent with arbitrarily uh, different preferences. Or rather, he delegates the uh, data exploration portion, the probing portion. Right? So what we do is we study the delegation gap in these settings, which is how much you lose by delegating the problem rather than solving it yourself. So the high-level message of the, paper, of the two papers is the following. Um, designing mechanisms with good delegation gap, meaning uh, you're competitive with the first best, um, reduces to familiar tools from uh, stochastic selection and stochastic optimization, tools like profit inequalities, Pandora's box algorithms, contention resolution schemes, and adaptivity gaps. Okay? So these tools allow us to compete with the uh, first best. Um, so let me make this a little more formal. Uh, our principal is going to face a stochastic packing problem. Those are the kind of problems we, we consider. Here you have a finite set of elements, a downwards closed feasible uh, constraint on these elements. And for each such element, the principal has a stochastic value uh, drawn from a, a known distribution, but the value itself is not, it has to be probed. Okay? So uh, like I said, the value may be probed, and this probing may be constrained uh, or costly. So if the principal was able to do the probing themselves, um, they would uh, run what's called a stochastic probing algorithm. And there's a literature on this, where they adaptively probe some subset of the elements to learn their values. Um, 
and then they select a subset of the probed elements that is feasible and maximizes their utility. So obviously, they would design this entire algorithm to optimally trade off their own utility versus the probing costs or constraints. Okay. Um, instead, we suppose that the principal considers delegating this to uh, an expert agent who's better equipped to do the probing of the data. And the agent also has their stochastic rewards, y sub e, for each element. And those may be different uh, for the, from the principles. Um, and again, the agent will perform the probing adaptively. Um, and after they do the probing, they, they send a signal to the principal, who then uses that information to select a feasible solution. The principal may also quit the mechanism, enforcing utilities of zero. Uh, so we make some modeling assumptions. Uh, I'm going to emphasize the first one here, which is uh, fairly standard in delegation and is actually importantly different from hidden action models in contract theory. So I'm going to assume that the principal observes his utilities for the um, elements that, he, that are in his selected solution. Okay? And um, this may occur either through experience by implementing the, uh, the solution, or um, as is more standard in the literature, um, we assume that the agent provides verifiable information about solutions they're suggesting to the principal. Okay? And the consequence of this is that the principal can stipulate and enforce requirements on the qualities of the solutions they're willing to accept. Okay? And intuitively, the way I like to think about this is that the agent can't lie about a solution he suggests to the principal, but he can emit information about other alternative solutions that they do not propose. That's kind of my intuitive way of thinking about this. So I'm also going to make standard assumptions like the priors are common knowledge. And also, I'm going to assume that uh, there's stochastic independence across the elements. Um, so our principal wants to design a mechanism to maximize his own utility. I'm going to adopt the no payments. I'm going to assume there's no payments. So this is a mechanism design problem without money. Um, and as was observed by Kleinberg and Kleinberg in a uh, closely related model, uh, this reduces to a very simple style of mechanism by taxation principle uh, arguments. Um, basically, you, all you have to worry about are single proposal mechanisms. Here, the principle's mechanism is just a menu of solutions they're willing to accept. So these are acceptable solutions. And when I say solution here, I mean a evaluated solution, a solution tagged with utilities that you require in order to accept it. Okay? So each element in the solution is tagged with utilities that you require for this, for this thing to be acceptable. Uh, so after that, the agent uh, adaptively probes some subset of the elements and then proposes a, uh, something from the menu. And this proposal must be valid in the sense that it must agree with the results of their probes. Because as we said, the agent can't benefit by lying because the, uh, they have to provide verifiable information. Okay. Uh, so a consequence of this is that there's two ways, the equivalent ways to look at this kind of problem. Either you delegate data collection or you delegate the full optimization problem. Those two perspectives are equivalent in this model. So uh, good. Um, obviously, if the principal and agent have the same utilities, you can recover the uh, first best, or the, what we call the undelegated optimum. Um, more generally, we want to see what happens when the agent has arbitrarily different preferences. And we measure uh, how much you lose by the delegation gap, which is the ratio of the principal's delegated utility to their uh, undelegated utility in the worst case over agents. So a little bit of background on this literature. Um, the work on delegation started um, with Holmstrom in the 70s. Um, and there's been a lot of work on e in econ on these kinds of problems. But that focused on characterizing the optimal mechanisms uh, with kind of real valued states and that kind of thing. Um, more relevant to us is the combinatorial uh, setting uh, of Armstrong and Vickers, who look at delegating the selection of one of n options. Uh, to an agent. And then um, what inspired uh, this line of work for us was uh, the work of Kleinberg and Kleinberg on delegated search, who uh, study the Armstrong and Vickers model and variants of it. And then they quantify the delegation gap in those settings. Uh, and there, they reduce uh, the delegation gap analysis to uh, the single choice profit inequality. 
So um, let me now uh, get into uh, some of our results. And let me start with the simplest, with kind of a simple special case of our model. Let me assume that actually data exploration is costless and unconstrained. So the agent may, uh, may probe all the elements without cost or constraint. Okay. No probing constraint, no probing costs. Even here, the problem is actually non-trivial. Um, because if you think about it, if the mechanism doesn't constrain the agent at all, if you say, hey, agent, explore the data and give me whatever you want, then an agent whose preferences are exactly the opposite of the principles will just propose the principles ex post worst solution, which obviously can be arbitrarily bad. Um, so what that means is that we have to design some non-trivial mechanism, or uh, not in the single proposal uh, setting, which is without loss, we have to design a non-trivial menu of acceptable solutions. Now, if you have such a menu, what the agent will do is that they will probe um, all the elements because there's no costs or constraints. And then they would propose their own favorite uh, solution off the menu. Uh, sorry, they would propose their own favorite solution that is actually on the menu. So the menu is doing something non trivial, it's cutting out some solutions uh, in a way that hopefully benefits the principle. Uh, and a theorem that we get in the first paper um, is that. As long as your optimization problem is nice enough, in particular the feasibility constraint is nice enough, the delegation gap in these kinds of settings is constant. And what do we mean by nice enough? We mean that it, you must admit a, a strong form of the generalized profit inequality. And that strong form means that your profit inequality must be greedy and it must work against a very powerful almighty adversary. Uh, in particular, if we have such a profit inequality with the ratio of alpha, we get a delegation gap of alpha, so it's nice and clean there. And also, uh, these kinds of strong profit inequalities actually do exist for pretty much most nice set systems like matroids, matchings, and so on. And this was shown by uh, the beautiful paper of Feldman, Svensson, and Zink Lucen on um, online contention resolution schemes. Okay. So, um, let me kind of walk you through intuition as to why this result might be true. So uh, let me actually focus on the special case that was examined in Kleinberg and Kleinberg. Here you have n elements and you want to select one of them. So this is the rank one matroid constraint. Now your undelegated optimal or the first best is the expected maximum reward over the elements. Now, let's imagine that these rewards are actually showing up online for a minute and recall the half profit inequality, uh, the threshold profit inequality of Samuel Kahn. Um, what it does is it picks a threshold T, which is the median of this, um, of this maximum uh, element reward. And then as elements arrived online, uh, you select the first element that beats the threshold. Okay, so we all uh, hopefully have seen this before. Um, we can turn this into a delegation mechanism by saying, hey, um, I'm going to say the principal commits to only accepting elements uh, whose quality exceeds this same threshold. Okay? So this would give me this menu right here. Um, so the key insight, one way to look at the key insight of Kleinberg and Kleinberg is the following. Uh, Samuel Kahn's proof actually holds, uh, if you think about it for a moment, even if the uh, elements arrive in a ex post worst case order. And this would actually result in selecting the smallest uh, xj that exceeds the threshold. And it turns out that that's actually exactly the same thing that a worst case agent would do when faced with this menu. So therefore, this mechanism inherits the guarantee of the profit inequality. So, Let's see how we can generalize this beyond selecting one, out of, one element out of n. Let's say you want to select several subject to a feasibility constraint f. Um, so this is our uh, benchmark here. Um, now let's imagine that you designed a menu that is a downwards closed, downwards closed family of solu evaluated solutions, meaning that if you accept a solution with certain utilities, then you'd also accept any subset of it with these same utilities. Now, if you think of a worst case agent that has opposite preferences to the principal, what they would do is they would just pick the principal's ex post least favorite uh, solution off this menu. Uh, well, not exactly. They would pick the principal's ex post least favorite maximal solution, where maximal is with respect to set inclusion. 
Okay? Because everything is non-negative, so they'd always rather pick a superset of something rather than a subset. So that's what a worst case principle would do if faced with some, some kind of downwards closed menu. And now we can do a thought experiment and say, OK, well, what if instead of this whole delegation thing, we instead considered a profit inequality, a greedy profit inequality algorithm that uh, basically accepts elements so long as you stay in this downwards closed menu R um, and um, see what happens if you run that against an almighty adversary who picks the worst case order. It turns out that in this setting, you would actually select the same thing as the agent would do. So therefore, if you have such a profit inequality with a ratio of alpha, you can back out of it a menu, a downwards closed menu, that would have the same guarantee in the delegation setting. And that's basically the idea of our proof. Um, and you know, like I said, these kinds of profit inequalities were shown uh, by Feldman, Svensson, and Zeklusen for most nice set systems. OK, so now we have thought, we basically have uh, bounded the delegation gap in the case of no costs or constraints on probing. Let's imagine what happens when I say information acquisition involves some kind of cost or constraint. Okay. Let's start with hard probing constraints. So there is set another set system that tells you which uh, elements you can probe. Right? So maybe you can evaluate at most k designs, like in my example, or you may spend at most t time, and so on. Um, now, in the kind of undelegated setting, this is what's known as a stochastic probing problem with inner and outer constraints. Inner constraints are what you can select. Outer constraints are what you can probe. So these things have been studied a lot. Um, and we have some interesting algorithms there, um, I guess, in the non-delegated setting. Um, and if we try and think of how we would turn this kind of, uh, how we'd get delegation mechanisms here, uh, there's an additional difficulty now where our benchmark, this undelegated optimal, it's more sophisticated because it involves some adaptive probing policy, right? Uh, so it's not clear how to use profit inequalities directly like we did before. So I boiled down the challenge to, to kind of this statement. Uh, how could you possibly incentivize a favorable adaptive probing st st uh, strategy by your agent given that um, you don't really see the agent sample path? You don't see the elements that the agent probed. Uh, and didn't select. So it's kind of you have very limited power to incentivize adaptivity in the way that you want. Okay. So that's kind of the challenge. And we kind of um, we find this challenge quite uh, difficult. So we kind of go around it. And we realize that you kind of don't really have to worry about that adaptivity. In many of these problems, a non-adaptive policy is enough. So with the appeal to the notion of adaptivity gaps in stochastic probing, uh, in particular, um, you ha this is the ratio of the best non-adaptive algorithm to the best adaptive algorithm for a optimization problem, for a stochastic optimization problem. And um, we show uh, in the ITCS paper that um, if the stochastic probing problem, the, the non-game theoretic version, uh, has adaptivity gap alpha, then you reduce the delegation problem uh, with constraints to the delegation problem without constraints, losing the factor of alpha. Okay, so alpha, uh, we basically reduced to the problem we solved earlier a few slides ago. So it's kind of, uh, you know, it's kind of basically an observation at this point, right? And the proof is very simple. You just basically tell the agent what to probe, and you basically tell them that you're on, they're only allowed to probe uh, this best non-adaptive set of elements, and then you commit to accepting only subsets of that. And this induces an unconstrained problem on that set P. Okay. Uh, and uh, it turns out there's a very general adaptivity gap results that we can plug into this theorem. Uh, in particular, this is a nice one to, uh, due to um, uh, Braddock, Singla, and Zuzik, I believe. Um, and we get basically constant delegation gap for any downwards closed probing constraint and any uh, solution constraints at the intersection of a constant number of matroids. Okay. So it's a kind of a beautifully general result we can use. OK, so that's it for hard constraints on probing. Uh, now I'm going to talk about briefly um, soft constraints in the form of costs. This was the topic of the talk that Neil gave 
um, earlier in EC. I'm going to give kind of just a brief recap and then point you to the to Daniil's talk and uh, our paper. So here, there's a known cost for probing an element, but there's no con hard constraints. Um, and now, if you think of the uh, problem in the absence of the delegation, this is just the generali a generalization of Pandora's box problem, a generalization of the Pandora's box problem of Weitzman, uh, where you're basically trying to select the best element out of a set uh, given costs of uh, exploration, cost of probing. Uh, there's a greedy algorithm due to Weizmann for solving this, and uh, there's generalizations of this to matroids, starting with the work of Singla and others. Okay. Um, so we consider a bunch of, it turns out when you have costs, there's kind of a, some modeling flexibility on who bears the exploration costs. We think of three models, one where the principal and agent split the costs equally or according to fixed percentages, uh, one where the principal pays the entire cost, and one where the principal stipulates as part of their mechanism what fraction of each item, uh, item's cost they're willing to pay. Right? Um, and now, um, in any case, uh, you, whatever your mechanism you design, it'll be a menu. And then once the agent sees that menu, they just solve the Pandora problem um, constrained to this menu by using their own utilities. And hopefully, you chose this menu carefully so that what they end up giving you is, on average, pretty good for the principal. Um, so uh, when we first looked at this, we asked ourselves, OK, well, there's this kind of uh, very nice redu reduction due to Espandiari, Hajigai, uh, Lucier, and Mitzenmacher that basically reduces these generalized Pandora's box problems to profit inequalities. So maybe we can kind of use um, our essentially, uh, uh, use our approach from before when we converted profit inequality algorithms to menus, maybe we can use that again here. And that seemed like it might work. Um, but it turns out that it doesn't due to a, uh, what seems to be an, a fundamental technical obstacle. Um, and this slide may make more sense for those of you who are familiar with Pandora's box. But in any case, I'll try and give you a quick recap. So algorithms for Pandora's box type problems, where you're trying to select an element and trying to probe elements and there's costs of probing, usually sp split each element's reward distribution into two parts. The, re the, the green part is I'm going to call the head, and the red part I'm going to call the tail. And dividing them is, what is this uh, particular um, threshold, which is often called the reservation price or the strike price or the, or the cap value. Um, and these algorithms, when you analyze them, the analysis usually requires uh, the following property. Um, basically, if you probe an element and their value ends up being in the tail, in the red part, then you better select that element. This is called non-exposure. And the reason this is required is that this strike price is chosen so that this tail exactly covers the cost of probing. So essentially, you can think of this as the part of the distribution of the reward of the element that is designated for covering the costs of data exploration. And the green part is the reward or bonus you get over and above that. Okay. So you better cover your costs. Otherwise, it's hard to get any non-trivial multiplicative guarantees. Um, so like I mentioned, this result reduces these kinds of problems to uh, profit inequalities, and their reduction, crucially, actually satisfies this non-exposure property. It's hard to even see what you'd do if you didn't. Um, and it alpha approximates the bonus, or the green part, and that gives us the alpha approximation uh, for the uh, undelegated uh, general problem. Okay. Um, so we could say, OK, let's derive a menu from their reduction in the same way we did before. And maybe that seems promising. But it turns out that if you think about it, um, there's kind of an additional uh, element that gets introduced here. There's, we interject an agent's choice here. The agent now has this menu, and um, they may make choices that are different that than what would be made by the profit inequality. And it turns out that there's examples where interjecting the agent's pro, uh, choice in this case breaks non-exposure in, in an important way. In particular, the agent may probe an element find that it's in the tail for the principal's reward distribution, but skip it, and then in, in favor of another element that they like much better. And it turns out that's, uh, that's hard to get around. Okay? So in, otherwise, in other words, employing our approach and the reduction of these guys 
we preserve the green part, but we kind of don't really preserve the red part, so we kind of break down exposure, and it's hard to analyze the resulting mechanism. Um, it turns out that this obstacle is fundamental and is provably insurmountable in some models, but we overcome it in other models. Um, and when we do overcome it, we basically end up using these strong contention resolution schemes of Feldman's, Venson, and Zink Lucin. So briefly, our results, I'm not going to go into the proof because you can refer to Neil's talk, hopefully it's recorded, or our paper. But basically, um, if uh, agent and principal split the costs, uh, but the reward distributions are binary, we get constant delegation gaps. And this generalizes the result of Kleinberg and Kleinberg for binary rewards and selecting one element out of n. But then we say in the same model, which is kind of the standard model in this setting, if we have arbitrary non-binary reward distributions, um, can we do anything? We prove that actually nothing non-trivial is possible. So really the obstacle I outlined before is pretty fundamental. Uh, then we look at the setting where the, aid, where the principal pays the entire uh, cost of probing. And there we get constant delegation gaps if we also discount the costs by a constant. Uh, so we get a bicriteria result. And the discounts, you can think of them as the benefit of probing. By delegating to the agent, their cost of exploration is a little smaller than yours. So uh, that's what we get for the free agent model. And in the custom cost model, we get constant uh, gaps um, without any uh, bicriteria type thing. Uh, and here, the principal has the most power, so it's not unsurprising that we do better. Okay. So like I said, see uh, Neil's talk or our paper for more details on this. Um, so let me close with some open problems. Uh, so our bounds are uh, very loose. We basically tried to use big hammers and didn't try to tweak anything. So conceivably, there are better approaches that really get much better guarantees. So our constants are uh, huge in some cases. Um, now, you could also ask yourself, well, what if I don't care about delegation gaps? I just want to compete against the uh, optimal uh, policy. I want to compete against second best, right? Um, you could ask, what is the computational complexity of that, or the computational complexity of approximations of that? Right? So that's a very interesting question we didn't really explore. Uh, and then finally, uh, what I think is possibly the juiciest of these questions is whether uh, using uh, randomized mechanisms helps. So we saw in earlier talks in contract theory, uh, in particular, uh, Matteo's talk was, was a beautiful example of this, um, that when you move to randomization, sometimes you can do a lot better in these types of settings. Um, and uh, it might be the case in delegation as well. Um, and uh, in the paper, we present some preliminary mixed evidence about this. There's some, some evidence suggests that you might be able to do better. Some evidence suggests that you might not be. Uh, but I think this is a pretty juicy question um, if you want to work on delegation. Okay. And that's it. Thank you. All right. Thanks a lot, Chadin. Do we have questions? Yeah, uh, that's a, a, a very good question. Um, Shadi, can yeah. you repeat the question for the uh, Sorry, uh, so the question was, we reduce delegation to profit inequalities. Does the reduction uh, go the other way? Um, well, certainly it won't be an approximation preserving reduction uh, because we basically, uh, we need kind of this greedy, almighty adversary property. But maybe, if you, let's say you restrict yourself to those and ask if the reduction goes both ways. Off the top of my head, I'm not sure. Neil, do you know? Uh, I, I have a about the online content. Like, the Yeah. To answer your question, uh, we haven't really thought about it enough. I'm not sure. It's a very good question, though. Yes. So can I ask a related question? Yeah, I was wondering whether the principle of that, uh, is it like, potentially even better than a strong profit say like, let's say I can accept two things. I can say the sum of the two things have to be at least something. I'm only yeah. willing to accept solutions where the sum of the two things is yeah. at least something. And that's something you can't do. Uh, no, that's right. Uh, so I mean, what we show is that even if we don't do that, we get constants. But very conceivably, you could do, you could improve our constants with uh, uh, something more intricate like that.
right? So in the interest of time, uh, let's thank uh, Shadin and all the speakers of the session. And since we are running uh, five minutes late, I would uh, suggest that we also start five minutes later than planned, so at uh, 25.